<clears throat> okay, so um, we'll get started today. Thank you all for joining us today uh, for this roundtable on understanding climate change on the Tibetan Plateau. My name is Evelyn Washell, and I direct the Modern Tibetan Studies Program at Columbia. I'd like to thank the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for sponsoring this event. This event is also co-organized with the Lamont Doherty Earth Observ Observatory at Columbia. And I have here with me my co-moderator, Brendan Buckley, professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and also a member of the Tree Ring Lab. We've been fortunate to work with Brendan and his colleagues on one of the exciting new directions of the Modern Tibetan Studies Program, collaborating on projects that bridge climate science on the Tibetan Plateau with the humanities and social sciences. As many of you know, the Tibetan Plateau is the largest and highest plateau in the world, the third largest source of ice and snow in the world after the Arctic and Antarctic, and the source of Asia, Asia's major rivers, bringing water to about a third of the world's population downstream. And as many of you probably also know, Tibet's glaciers and permafrost are melting at an alarming rate as global temperatures rise, and these have implications not only for local Tibetan communities and regional climate, but also for global climate uh, variability. And an inter interesting point to note is that Tibetan writers as early as the ninth century knew the significance of their land too. On the east face of the 821-822 stone treaty inscription that's um, located in front of the Jokong Temple in Lhasa, we find a line that describes Tibet as being the center of the high snow mountains and the source of the great rivers. And as we will hear from some of our panelists today, local Tibetan communities retain a wealth of knowledge about their land and the impacts of climate vari uh, variability on it. So this round table today is part of an ongoing series of discussions that brings together uh, social scientists working with Tibetan communities on the, the Tibetan plateau and climate scientists who have worked in the broader Asian region to share their work and discuss how um, interdisciplinary approaches might and rich understandings of climate change on the Tibetan pl uh, plateau and also contribute to our knowledge of global climate change. So we'll hear a short presentation from each of our panelists, about 15 minutes each, followed by a discussion among the panelists. And um, for the audience members, at any point during the talk, you can type your questions into a Q&A box and we will take your questions at the end as time permits. I'll um, give a brief introduction to each of our panelists. Our first speaker will be Hung uh, Nguyen. He's a postdoctoral research scientist at the Lamont, uh, scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia. He uses tree rings to infer changes in the water cycle in the distant past and applies this knowledge to water resource management and reconstruction of centuries of discharge history for many rivers in Asia. And he'll be giving us a talk on monthly stream, for, uh, uh, stream flow reconstruction from tree rings and potential applications for water management in Tibet. Our second speaker will be Boniface Fosu, who is also a postdoctoral research scientist at uh, Lamont Doherty. And his research models interactions between weather and climate, and it em uh, emphasizing the links between extreme weather and human induced climate change and he'll be talking about extreme events and climate change with some implications for Tibet. Our third speaker will be Kelly Hopping, who is an assistant professor in human environment systems at Boise State University in Idaho. Her inter interdisciplinary research examines how global climate change is affecting ecosystems and livelihoods, particularly in pastoral and rangeland systems. And she'll be talking on the local impacts of global climate change from Western scientific and pa uh, pastoral perspectives. Our fourth speaker will be Emily Ye, who is a professor in the geography department at the University of Colorado Boulder. She conducts research on development and nature society relations in Tibetan parts of China. She will share her work on Tibetan understandings of the causes of environmental degradation, including climate change. Then our fifth and final speaker will be Hua Zijia, He's an environmental anthropologist at the University of Michigan who researches Tibetan pastoralists' way of theorizing and relating to their ancestral land. And Huatze will talk about his research on local narratives of land and community degradation in Eastern Tibet. Uh, so with that, um, I will turn things over to Hung who will start off um, the, the, uh, the series.
Thank you, um, Evelyn, for the introduction. Um, so from um, my introduction, you have realized that I haven't done research on Tibet itself. Um, I'm a dendrohydrologist. I study tree rings and I study water management. And what I'm bringing to the table today is um, a few ideas that I hope could be applied to Tibet. Um, on the background of the slide is the uh, Zhangmu Dam, which is the first dam on the Yanglu Tsangpo River, the upstream of the Brahmaputra. And we're going to revisit this dam uh, in the talk. But, um, so um, the, the title of today's talk is Monthly Stream Flow Reconstruction from Tree Rings Potentials for Water Management in Tibet. The word uh, stream flow here means uh, river discharge. Um, so I study tree rings because uh, trees are amazing. They can tell us a lot about past climate. Here it's a, uh, in the picture you can see, this is the annual rings of trees. And you probably remember from secondary school biology that if you count the rings, you will know how old the tree is. But trees um, tell us more than just their age. You can observe that the rings are not the same. Some are very wide and some are very narrow. The white rings correspond to wet years and the narrow ring corresponds to um, dry years. So you, if you know how to decipher the rings, you can um, reconstruct what happened in the past in rivers, in rainfall for a particular region. Um, why is that important? Because we need to have a long record of rainfall, or a long record of uh, river discharge in order to make better decision. Um, a typical, a classic example of um, the important role of tree rings is the Colorado, Colorado River Compact. Uh, this is an agreement that was signed in 1922 and it divides um, water in the Colorado River among the seven states in the southwestern US. So they um, measure um, uh, discharge for about um, 20 years and they did. Uh, decided that, okay, the average discharge will be about 20 kilometers cube per year. So let's allocate 18.6 kilometers cube per year um, over seven states. But um, later it was found that the average discharge is much less than the allocation. Um, the measurement period happened to be um, the wettest period in four centuries, which means that water that is uh, normally not available in the river was legally divided among the states and that caused a lot of water stress. And because of that, the Colorado River no longer reaches the Pacific Ocean today. And how do we know that? How did we know that the measurement period happened to be the wettest set because of tree rings? Using trees, uh, these scientists have, were able to reconstruct four centuries of stream flow or uh, river discharge for the river and found out that um, the measurement period happened to be the wettest. Since the classical studies in 1976, there have been hundreds of studies um, of, of tree ring, um, using tree rings to reconstruct stream flow around the world. And one of them was done in Tibet. Um, so this is the city of Lhasa, which lies on the Lhasa River. And um, some uh, scientists from China using tree rings in the region have reconstructed uh, five centuries of history for the Lhasa River. And if you can see here is the modern period. And if you look at the entire history, in the past, the river has experienced more severe drought and bigger floods than what is observed in the instrumental period. So if you make water management decision based on only the modern period, you're, you're not seeing the entire um, range of data and you might make the same, you might see the same problem that happened in the Colorado River. Um, so tree, tree ring studies have uh, shown a lot of uh, values in water management, but there is still a problem uh, or, or a limitation. The limitation is that most stream flow reconstructions are annual because the trees are annual, have annual rings. They, un, they, they produce one ring per year. So you, you can only have one estimate of um, river discharge or stream flow per year. But most water management decisions are made at shorter intervals. For example, crop plantings are usually done season by season. If you have a reservoir, the discharge are usually decided weekly or monthly, uh, sometimes even daily, depending on the size of the reservoir. 
So the question is, how do we get monthly stream flow from annual tree rings? And that was the top, uh, the major topic of my research. Uh, we can um, do that by combining multiple tree ring proxies in a clever way. Um, so using the data that I have, um, I'm going to try to, to see if I can get monthly stream flow from annual tree rings. Um, in at Colombia, we have developed a very vast network of uh, tree ring sites uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Most of the, these network are the, um, um, the, the work of Brandon. Um, we, so we use tree rings and we also use uh, oxygen isotopes. The idea is uh, actually quite simple. We have, um, so oxygen has two stable isotopes, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Uh, they are differ by, different by the number of neutrons. So oxygen 18 is heavier, um, so it's harder to evaporate um, and, and um, easier to precipitate. So the ratio between oxygen 18 and oxygen uh, 16 would, will also tell you about um, the wetness or the dryness of uh, a particular year. So, um, so my goal is to combine tree rings and oxygen isotope at all these different sites. Each of them have a different seasonal sensitivity to um, reconstruct monthly stream flow. So the method that I use is called combinatorial optimization. Um, you can think of it as a packing problem. I have, I have multiple uh, trees, multiple sites. I need to pack them, select a subset of them for January, select a subset of them for February and so on. It's just like you have multiple items you need to pack um, and you go on a trip, you need to pack each of them, a uh, subset of them into one um, luggage and an another subset into another luggage. Um, so there's a lot of math involved, uh, but, but I'm not going through all the detail. But uh, the, the simple idea behind it is just to optimize the selection of these proxies for each month. And I'm, I'm going to apply that to the Chao Preya River Basin in Thailand. So, so here is the location of the basin. And here is a topographic um, map of the basin. I will reconstruct a stream flow for the four tributaries of the, of the Chao Preya, which is the Ping, the Wang, the Yom, and the Nan. So these are the, the locations that I'm working, that I worked on. And um, here are the results. Um, so after a lot of math and a lot of computation, we arrive at a reconstruction that matches the uh, the targets very well. So at at the end of the day, what we have is um, four hundred years of uh, stream flow for the four rivers, but at monthly interval. So so this is a big uh, improvement from the, the typical reconstruction that you would get, which is annual. And uh, using using that monthly reconstruction, um, we were able to. Um, examine the um, intra-annual um, variability. For example, we were able to see in each year when was the peak flow season starts. So this is um, an indication of the monsoon, wh whether the monsoon starts early in the year or later in the year. And, and we can see that variation across the four rivers. Um, for example, in the pink, you can see that the, the, the start of the um, monsoon season can vary anywhere between April and September, but in the Nan, which is on the northeast, um, the monsoon season is pretty much very consistent. It only starts in July, and um, you can also see the influence of the the start of the season to the overall dryness or wetness of the year. Um, so each dot here is one year, and you can see that if the monsoon season starts um, early, it, the year tends to be wet, and the monsoon se if the monsoon season starts late. Uh, the years tend to be dry. For example, in, you can see that in August, you usually have more dry years than wet years, uh, more red dots and blue dots. So, so this helps us to examine um, the variation of rivers within a year, not just um, throughout the entire year as with typical um, tree ring studies. Um, so that, that's, a method, that's a new method that um, we have developed and I'm looking forward to apply uh, this knowledge to um, Tibet. Uh, the potential applications um, are threefold. Uh, first is in terms of water supply. 
uh, Lhasa re River supplies about 85% of the water demand for the uh, Lhasa for the capital of uh, Tibet. So any, wat any water management decision that is made, any water supply decision that is made, need to rely on good knowledge of the variation of river flow. And we have seen from the from the case of Colorado River, you can't just rely on 40, 50 years of, of uh, measurement. You need to have a longer history. And, that, and that's where uh, triggering studies can be helpful. Um, the second aspect is in terms of hydropower. Um, Tibet um, needs a lot of energy for development. Um, it doesn't have a lot of fossil fuel. So hydropower has become very attractive um, th there has been a lot of talk going on about the developing hydropower. So building hydropower itself is a controversial topic, but if you decide to do it, then you have to do it right. Uh, based on good measurement, based on um, the reservoir has to be sized correctly, uh, the release decision has to be made correctly and so on. Um, so that that is another um, venue where good understanding of long-term variability from that, that is provided by tree rings can be helpful. And the, and the last um, area and the third area that I think tree rings can be helpful for Tibet is um, in terms of understanding the climate. Uh, we know that many rivers in Asia is closely linked to the ocean um, through the El Nino and La Nina phenom phenomenon. For example, in Southeast Asia, if you have an El Nino, um, you tend to have a very dry year. And on the other hand, if you have a La Nina, you tend to have a very wet year. So if you, so if you have um, a long uh, history of rivers, uh, you can examine the relationship between the oceans and the rivers more robustly. And, and from then you can have better models of floods and droughts, um, which you can find out more in Boniface's talk. Um, uh, finally, I would like to have a a broader remark. Um, we know that Tibet is the water tower of Asia. It is the source of many large rivers. So if we understand the, the um, behavior of the water cycle in Tibet in a longer term via tree rings, then we can understand better the behavior of the down, all the downstream river. And that is also an exciting uh, topic that can be uh, researched for the region. So my take home messages are simple. With triggering science, we can reconstruct centuries of monthly stream flow for Tibet. And with that, we can improve Tibet's water management and we can also improve our understanding of the global water cycle. If you have further questions, um, I'm happy to receive a uh, question. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or email or put your question into the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hung. Um, and now we'll go to Boniface. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, yeah, so um, from my um, title, um, you can, I'll just go straight to the point because from my title, you can clearly see that I'm going to talk about extreme events and um, climate change. And um, this is one important aspect of, of my research, um, which is um, extreme event attribution. And it is um, simply trying to um, give credit to something. So extreme events um, like drought and, um, and flood, as you can see here, um, have a lot of contributors. Um, so oftentimes we are interested in um, decide, deciding whether man-made global warming um, or anthropogenic greenhouse gases um, was one of them. So in order to do that, 
um, it is important to discriminate the aspects of the climate that occurs um, naturally um, without the influence of um, man-made global warming or anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And I'm going to explain a little further in my, in my next slide. Right, so um, like, so as you can see um, from here, you see that we do experience short-term um, to long-term fluctuations in the climate system, which is caused by many processes. So let's take temperature, for example, um, as you can see here in the, in the blue, blue, um, blue line, and it fluctuates around the mean or zero because here I've removed the mean. Um, so it's zero, but it fluctuates around that. So if you take long-term chunks of this plot or this line, the average will remain the same. Um, but the cyclical variations you see, or if you will, the ups and downs will lead to different climate impacts and weather. So this is called natural climate variability. And the natural climate on its own can drive extremes. So when you have the ups, you can have different types of climate, which translates to different um, types of um, weather and the extremes. And then when you have those um, um, downs, it's just you can have um, different types of climate and different types of um, extremes. So now let's add the um, impact of human induced warming, which is um, going to be the next line you see. Um, um, to if we add the impact of human human induced warming, which is the red um, red line, to the natural variability, the two combined still have the cyclical variations, which is what you see um, in in the in the in the mole. Um, and again, they are also driven by many processes. But now the mean is going to change for different chunks you you take. So this is currently the climate we are experiencing. So it's the nat natural climate plus human um, um, anthropogenic, uh, the, the impacts of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So my research tries to separate the impact of the human component of the warming and then the kind of climate and whether they drive or induce from that of the natural variability and then the kind of weather and climate um, they induce, especially the um, extreme part of it. So the, the, the next slide, which basically um, what I'm trying to say here is that when all is said and done, the, what the everyday person wants, wants from us is to um, get accurate predictions. So at the very minimum, what we do um, with attribution studies directly provide a baseline level of um, understanding that can help um, 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 others or ourselves develop simple predictive tools that can be used for um, to supplement um, predictions for extremes and other um, weather and climate events. So that's at the very base of um, what we do. Um, so hopefully this kind of framework is going to help you understand um, the example that I'm, um, the, the, what I'm going to talk about or the events that I'm going to talk about in relation um, to today. So um, the so um, the as most of us will know, the Tibetan plateau, um, because of its location and um, elevation, it has a huge influence on the global climate. So um, it steers weather systems away from the center of the continent, and then it also drives um, monsoon systems, um, um, the monsoon system, um, amongst other things. So in the same breath, the Tibetan Plateau in the surrounding region is also susceptible to extreme events like drought and flood and are becoming more um, intense due to um, global warming. Um, and the, Tibet is also impacted by tropical cyclones that form in the Bay of Bengal, but maybe not as strongly and directly as the regions along the coast, but that could, that could change. And, and and this is why. 
So what you see, um, the next slide, is um, you, um, these are some images from October 14, 2000, um, 2014. And during this time, an unanticipated blizzard um, initiated uh, an avalanche that killed um, 43 people um, um, in the Himalayas um, and uh, caused a lot of destruction in the region. Um, so this most most of this destruction occurred on the Nepal side of the of the of, of the Himalayas, but it doesn't preclude um, Tibet from experiencing a similar incident in the future. And I'm going to explain why um, um, starting from this next slide. So the blizzard was connected to um, with tropical cyclone Hood Hood. Um, it, which was a category four tropical cyclone that developed in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and after making landfall on Oct October 12 in Eastern India, the remnant of um, tropical cyclone Hood Hood proceeded northward towards the Himalayas, as you can see, you can see here um, in, in a second. Um, so the um, so the remnant proceeded north. So the remnants of tropical cyclones, even after they've made landfall, leave a lot of precipitation in their wake. So during this time, after the tropical cyclone made landfall on October 12th, around the same time, there was a short wave trough um, or simply a low pressure system also, um, which is also associated with moisture and precipitation that was moving eastward. As you can see, um, you will see in a second, um, eastward across the Himalayas as well. So the two systems collided. Um, so the upper, upper, upper level trough collided with the remnants of the tropical cyclone and led to unprecedented precipitation, which eventually led to the avalanche that killed so many people. Um, the tropical cyclone itself killed way more people, but uh, here I'm being I'm talking specifically about the avalanche and um, in the Himalayas that killed 43 people. So this event was particularly unique because unlike most Bay of Bengal storms that dissipate quickly after landfall, tropical cyclone Hood Hood um, had been the only tropical cyclone whose remnants had ever reached as far north as the Himalayas. And the worrying part is there was no warning system prior to um, this occurring. So um, the next slide, um, let's see whether tropical cyclone Hood Hood um, was a one-off and I would say probably not. So this plot shows the post monsoon, this is from September to October, tropical cyclone tracks in the Bay of Bengal over the period of 1979 to 2014. And the tracks of tropical, the track of tropical cyclone Hudu is showed in the thick black, and then the tracks in blue are the cy tropical cyclones that developed prior to 1996, and those in red are um, the tropical cyclones that developed post 96. And you see that most of the blue tracks, um, after making landfall, they track eastward across India. And in contrast, if you look at the red tracks, which are the more recent, recent tracks, they move north and northeastward. And subsequently, we got a storm um, like tropical cyclone Hood Hood that was strong enough to move north and reach as far as far as the Himalayas. So the next thing we want to do is, okay, now we know these storms tend to move um, northward. Um, in recent times. And then we've had one that is, um, that is whose remnants has reached as far north as the um, Himalayas and has caused a lot of um, destruction. So we want to do the attribution parts now, which is what you're going to see on the next slide, is we want to, um, how do we determine whether this, is, uh, this event was human driven or this is simply a natural occurrence, which is very important, important if you're going to make any meaningful um, future climate change predictions and um, 
um, prediction. So this is the attribution part. So here we turn to climate models for answers. Um, climate models are not always do not are not always the, you, um, um, uh, accurate, but they are very very useful useful tools, especially when it comes to um, climate studies like this, like attribution studies, because in the real world, um, naturally driven climate and human induced um, processes are all bungled together and are, and are not easy to discriminate. So in a climate model, we can run a, a version of the model where we turn certain um, processes or forces off. Um, and we can really do that in the, in the real, real world, can you? So by doing that, we can truly pinpoint the role human induced greenhouse gases um, um, has played in the climate of a particular region at a particular time um, and, and, and then versus that of natural forces. So here we look at um, um, we look at different versions of the climate model with different forces. So B is the version of the model with just natural forces. So here we have forces like volcanic eruptions and sunspot act you know, activities and um, stuff like that. These are all natural. Um, we don't have any um, anthropogenic greenhouse gases in this version of the model. Um, in C, that's the version of the model which um, measures the impact of um, um, anthropogenic um, aerosols on the climate system. And then and D is the version of the model that measures the impact of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And A is when we put all of them together. So by looking at the um, B, C, and D, and just opposing that with D, we can tell which um, one of these, um, which versions of the, um, 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 of the, of the which one of these forces is driving what we see in A. And um, the plot here shows in vectors, these are, these are just um, lower level, um, these are just winds. And then in the shading, this is just the aerial frequency of the tropical cyclone. So just focus on the aerial frequency. The warm colors are just, um, it just tells you that there are more tropical cyclones turning in, um, in that direction. And then the, um, the, if there is a dip in the, in, the, in the wind pattern, it also means that there is a deepening of the trough in that region. So basically what this plot is telling us is that this, um, the higher frequency of tropical cyclone in the Northern Bay of, ben Bay, Bay of Bengal in, in plot A or in the historical experiment where we put all the three together is being driven by anthropogenic aerosols and greenhouse gases, as we can see from those plots. And then we can also tell from the plot that there is a deepening of the um, monsoon, um, the trough in, um, in those two um, regions. So the next plot is similar. It also tells us that um, the next plot is showing sea surface temperature, which is a key ingredient for tropical cyclones to form. And from here, we can clearly see that the warming of um, um, the SSD in the Bay of Bengal, which um, presupposes that they are going, um, more tropical cyclones are going to be favored, um, is being driven by anthropogenic greenhouse, greenhouse gases. So from this attribution, we can tell that um, anthropogenic greenhouse gases together with aerosols, um, anthropogenic aerosols are driving more tropical cyclones and stronger tropical cyclones towards the, um, the um, northern part of the Bay of Bengal. And they're, they're not, after they make landfall, they don't go eastward like they used to, but now they are turning um, north, um, north, north and northeastward. And um, a storm or a tropical cyclone like um, tropical cyclone hood hood um, can, can, can become something frequent in, um, in the near future. So the next plot um, shows that all the, um, the jet in the, also the jet has shifted downwards. So if the, the, for instance, if this were the original position of the, of the jet, 
um, our research, which I'm not showing here, shows that it's shifted slightly downwards. So it's bringing more storms like the um, one that I discussed earlier towards the Himalayas. So if you have more storms and more the storm track closer to the Himalayas, and you have stronger tropical cyclones in the Bay of Bengal that have the potential of um, um, the remnants of which can reach as far as the Himalayas, then that's a potential for this interaction, which we call an extratropical tropical interaction to occur again. And that can cause a lot of distraction in the um, Himalayas and then the region surrounding it, which includes Tibet. So the last plot that I, the last thing that I want to show is the, we did, um, this is an analysis to help us determine whether this kind of, um, indeed, these kind of um, um, interactions are going to be, are going to be more frequent in, in the future. And that's exactly what we found. So here we are looking at the correlation between storms like um, um, storms in the Bay of Bengal and upper, upper level, um, um, low pressure um, upper level systems like the one that I talked about earlier, and we use two different um, criteria to to look at it. And in both, we see that. And I want you to focus on the red line. You see that the uh, there is a higher there's, there's this increasing probability of um, such interactions occurring um, and um, as the years progress, and that's what resulted in tropical cyclone Hoodwood. So the um um the the take home message um which is um my um the take home message is that the himalayan snowstorm of october 2014 resulted from this unusual measure between the tropical cyclone um a, a tropical cyclone in the bay of bengal and an upper level trough and they are and this led to a lot of moisture in the himalayas a lot of precipitation that led to Led, excuse me, to an avalanche, and um, eventually led to um, 43 fatalities and a lot of um, several billion um, millions of dollars in um, damages. So, and there is a possibility of um, this kind of event, a um, strong possibility of this kind of event happening again in the near future. So, at the very least, um, forecasters in the region can use. Uh, are aware of these kind of interactions because again the this event wasn't forecasted it wasn't foreseen um, and at the very least um, forecasters in the region can be aware of the possibility of th this kind of um, these kind of interactions um, as, especially in Tibet as well um, Tibet and then um, in Nepal and then it's also another reason to take climate um, action seriously and um, um, make sure that we're doing all we can to um, um, mit mitigate the impact of um, 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 climate change and that we are also reducing our, our um, um, greenhouse gas emissions. But not just that, more, we, it's also important to look at anthropogenic aerosols. And we know that the um, Indo-Gangetic Plains is one of the regions um, which is very close to the Himalayas. It's one of the regions where um, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's um, a huge emission of anthropogenic aerosols. So it's important that we not just look at the greenhouse gas emissions, but we're also looking at um, 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 emissions of um, anthropogenic aerosols. So um, I'll, I'll welcome any questions and um, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Boniface, for that presentation. Um, and so next, we will hear from Kelly. Hi, thank you all. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about my work uh, looking at the local impacts of global climate change in Tibet. And so to orient you a bit to um, to, to my work, I'm really interested in Tibetan social and ecological systems under global climate change. And so to do this, I'm trying to work at the intersection 
of how ecosystems are functioning and the services they're providing to people, and then the local knowledge systems and livelihoods of the communities living on the plateau, and then how these are um, embedded within and interacting with natural resource management institutions that are um, constraining or offering opportunities for how people can interact with these ecosystems as the climate changes. And so today I want to just go over some really high level highlights of some different studies that I've been fortunate to be a part of. And so the first is taking an ecological perspective to understanding how climate change and livestock grazing are impacting alpine meadows in central Tibet. And then I'll um, discuss briefly some of the local knowledge from pastoralists about the environmental changes that they're observing around two large salt lakes. And then I'll end with uh, looking at how climate is affecting an alternative livelihood to um, raising livestock, namely caterpillar fungus harvesting or yartsugambu um, across the entire region. And so part of what motivates me to do this work is that a lot of assumptions are made about environmental degradation in Tibet. Um, and so on the side of the yartsugambu harvesting, there's uh, an often kind of uncritical immediate assumption that is asserted in the scientific literature that people are, they must be over harvesting it and that is unsustainable. And so here you can see a picture from one scientist's um, kind of internal reporting on a study that he was conducting saying like, oh, look at how much people are destroying the ground. Like they say they weren't digging here, but look at all the holes that they've created. And then he later went back and realized that this was, these holes that you see were caused by pheasants, a kind of bird that was digging for roots. And I've seen lots of other studies where they show pictures where uh, they say that it's people causing the damage. And in fact, it's very clearly pica burrows. Um, or sometimes, or most of the time, people don't have um, evidence. They just say that people are over harvesting. And there's not really strong data to necessarily support that, but a lot of concern over um, both the environmental and social consequences if they are. On the, on the livestock side, there are also a lot of assumptions about overgrazing and poor livestock management being the cause of environmental degradation. And here you can see a brochure that was distributed by the government to the village in which I was working. That's showing if you have few livestock, the ecosystem and the animals are healthy, but then you have more livestock and inevitably this leads to desertification and the livestock starve and you can see skeletons of animals here in this picture. And so in neither case are these really recognizing the um, local knowledge or agency that people could be bringing to these situations for how to manage the resources sustainably. Um, and, and I think that's a problem that I want to explore. Um, but the reality is, is that policy decisions and management decisions are being made based on these kind of uncritical assumptions. And so just to give a um, snapshot of this, uh, in central Tibet where I was working, there's evidence that people have been herding livestock there for around 8,000 years. And then for the first time, basically in 2005, the, there was a new um, initiative where they had to start limiting their livestock numbers and putting up fences in the name of managing the ecosystem better and to prevent environmental degradation. And they've continued to experience more fences or being uh, our mandatory herd size limitations mandatory and the certain progression of this is toward increasing livestock removal, assuming that they are the problem. So this is representing a major change in how um, people are interacting with the environment um, at the same time that we know obviously climate change is occurring along the same timeline. And so the Tibetan plateau has already experienced warming at a greater rate than the global average and is continue or projected to continue to increase in temperature by up to five degrees Celsius, which is a massive amount of warming um, by the end of the century. And so um, my first question is to try to understand, like we do see some places in which the environment is, condition is going down, but what is the role of climate and what is the role actually of livestock grazing in these alpine meadows? And so to do this, um, I worked in central Tibet at a place called Namso, um, north of Lhasa, and I set up a big experiment for five years that you can see in this little inset photo that these 
white things are warming chambers that act as little greenhouses to simulate climate warming and raise the temperature on those plots. And then we had um, yaks come to the experiment. Um, and so we had every combination of yaks, we know yaks, warming or no warming to test what effect they're really having. And then in addition, I went around to different places on the landscape where there are areas where the meadows are already showing signs of degradation just naturally without me manipulating it in any way. Um, also to healthy intact meadows and then to shrub meadows that are dominated by um, woody shrubs instead of um, the kind of more grass-like plants you see in this picture. And then in all these plots, I did vegetation and soil measurements. And so um, to just give you some of the top results from this. Uh, first of all, here you can see the experiment from a distance. All those little white things are the warming chambers and there's a, a house in the background for scale. Um, and so what we found uh, is that when yaks were on the plots grazing, they were really able to maintain the dominant alpine meadow plant species, bonsa or cabrigia pygmaea, which is a dwarf sedge, very uh, short plant with shallow roots that forms these turfs that's basically almost everything you see in this picture. And so when yaks were there, they actually had more of this plant growing and um, a healthier ecosystem. Then when we added warming with the grazing, within five years, we were able to shift those plots into a degraded meadow state that was dominated. Well, the, the bonsai or the cabrigia died back with the warming, which multiple lines of evidence were pointing toward the warming, drying out the soil and that shallow rooted plant couldn't survive. And then it was replaced by um, this black lichen crust um, that's really a hallmark of a degraded meadow. Then if we removed the ax and had no grazing, like as policy would suggest is the solution to environmental degradation, um, what we actually saw is that this did not at all reverse the effects of warming. It didn't shift it back to a healthy um, ecosystem. Instead, we just got a significant increase in these shrubs, the woody plants. And whether there were yaks there or not, the warming then led to less carbon sequestration or less storage of carbon in the ecosystem relative to the healthy meadows, which is a problem from a global climate perspective. We want the ecosystem to be storing more carbon and, and it's not with warming. And then really importantly with warming, again, whether yaks were there or not, we had a 25% decrease in forage production or the plants that are eaten by um, wildlife and livestock. And so this is really I think, significant for what this means, the implications for these households that are dependent on their animals, that the animals are getting basically less to eat and less nutritious um, vegetation under climate warming. However, I want to point out that um, I was also part of a study where we looked at a bunch of these different, well, 12 of these different warming experiments across the plateau. And so um, they're shown with these um, dots and triangles here on the map along a precipitation gradient where it's wetter in the east to drier in the central and western plateau. And so all these different scientific teams had done sort of a similar thing to what I had done and were getting different results. And so when we brought them all together, what we found is that um, that sites that had permafrost um, or were had wetter, more precipitation in the year, the plants there were able to respond more positively to the warming because they had enough water to support that extra growth. Whereas we were seeing decreases in the vegetation in the drier areas without permafrost. And so just wanna point out that the responses to climate warming are not the same. They're not universal across Tibet. And a lot of work that's done in the Eastern Plateau cannot just be extrapolated and assumed that we'll see the same responses in um, the drier regions further west. So now I wanna to turn to um, the, from the pastoralist perspective, like the environmental changes that they're observing. And so for this, um, again, working at Namso Lake here, um, doing interviews with people. And then I was able to collaborate with Dr. Yindanima who spoke in this um, series last year about our study at Serling. So, um, so I'll just, talk very briefly about that since he's spoken about that here before, but looking at um, the changes observed in these two regions. And so first at NAMSO, um, showing kind of an aggregate picture of what people were reporting that they've been observing and the way the environment is changing. There's really strong consensus that they're seeing less rainfall, um, which I think corresponds well to one of the graphs that Hung showed right at the beginning uh, for the uh, area around the loss, around Lhasa. Um, and so they connected this decrease in rainfall 
to declines in meadow vegetation amount and health and that it's getting replaced by the black lichen crusts and so this fits really well with what i was simulating essentially or creating with my experiment but they were they're observing it as a decrease in rainfall whereas i was achieving it with um, warming so it's an interesting sort of parallel um, and in addition, under drier conditions with less rainfall, they're observing in increase in toxic plants that uh, do better when it's drier. And so specifically, they're referring to tomsa or loco weed. It's called often in English, it's really toxic to the livestock. And so this combination of more toxic plants and less vegetation has had a negative impact on livestock health. And they're observing their animals that have smaller body sizes, they're producing less milk. And in return, they have the, they observe a reciprocal relationship where they say the meadow also depends on the livestock. So as the livestock health is decreasing, that's also bad for the meadows. People were less um, in agreement about how the temperature was changing relative to their strong observations of the decline in rainfall, but they did report increases in temperature, which they linked to melting snow in the mountains and specifically on snow mountains or Kongji. And that snow then melts and it runs off into the lake. And like many large lakes in Tibet, it's a closed basin. So there's streams flowing in, but no streams flowing out, which means that as that snow is melting and running into the lake, it just fills it like a, a bathtub. And so then in areas where the lake shore isn't very steep, um, the lake can rapidly uh, flow over the land. And so they reported that they're actually losing a lot of land that is now underwater because of the lake. They also talked about the increase in fences, um, which is decreasing livestock mobility and is bad for their health. But also um, in the context of talking about environmental change, like fully one third of the interviewees brought up how this is leading to an increase in conflict between people and especially between villages. In particular, now they have to cut across what's perceived as um, other people's land, where one quote uh, said, everybody says, this is my land, his land, and that's not good. So there's this perception now of ownership in the land that wasn't, that's shifted from uh, before the fences. And so as people are doing their seasonal rotations with the livestock, they end up cutting across, across what's now perceived as other villages' land leading to conflict. And villages are being affected to varying degrees by how much their land has been inundated. And then they're like losing meadow vegetation through these impacts of drying and possibly warming. And so they're basically just getting a lot more stress in the system, which is being expressed with interpersonal conflict that was really concerning to people. Now, if I turn quickly to this other large salt lake, which is now overtaken Namso as the largest lake because of its own expansion. Um, the, the, I'm just showing here the, the southwest corner of it. And Yudunima did interviews here in this village and it's shown by the orange dot. And so like with Namso, Serlingso has been experiencing a gradual increase in the lake size and level for decades. But different from Namso, they had this kind of extreme event um, from fall 2003 to spring 2004, where what this is showing is the lake is frozen in both of these images and then this dark area here, um, these are satellite images. And so that's showing actually like, uh, open water, not frozen water, that the lake level got so high that it broke over this strip of land that's a hill and started flowing over into this other smaller lake, which then quickly flooded these light green areas, which are wetland meadows, um, it created this whole new lake and almost every household in the village lost their houses or pastures or livestock shelters to the lake expansion very rapidly. And so when we were asking them about the kind of long-term consequences of this, um, they reported in particular declines in livestock numbers because now they don't have as much land or the land is covered in salt, which prevents the animals from eating the plants there. Um, and so there's a big decrease in horses, which is because they're getting motorcycles, but there's also a big decrease in yaks because yaks in particular rely on the wetland, the more nutritious wetland vegetation. And so they're shifting to only be able to raise primarily now more sheep and goats than before because they can be more resilient to the kind of new conditions they find themselves in. And so they're getting a reduction in livestock as the population continues to grow. So again, this sort of squeezing of resources that they're facing um, as the environment changes. But in contrast to Namso, 
um, they expressed that because so many of them had lost large areas of their pastures, um, they don't have enough land to graze their livestock, that they decided to share the remaining land under the principle of sharing each other's happiness and sorrow. And so they wanted the impacts to be distrib distributed much more evenly between them. And they even petitioned the county government to let them go back to a more communal way of using the land um, so that they could distribute the impacts of this lake expansion more equally, which is in contrast to Nome so where with um, similar environmental change, although there are key differences, um, they, that led to more conflict. So uh, just interesting contrasts, I think, between how different communities are faced with and coping with these changes. Now, finally, I wanna quickly turn to um, this alternative or addition to livestock raising that is caterpillar fungus harvesting. And so um, this is showing some model results we did of where caterpillar fungus or Yertsugambu is likely to grow in the warmer colors. And so you can see it's mostly on the Tibetan plateau, but it does extend down into the Southern Himalayas and in India, Nepal and Bhutan. So this is looking across this whole region. Um, and so I did a systematic literature review of all the publications that I could find on either the social or ecological aspects of Nyertsugambu. And these data found almost 400 and they dated back to the 1700s with early missionary accounts reporting back about seeing um, Nyertsugambu being traded or used in China. Um, and then I also conducted 49 interviews with um, harvesters and traders in the Tibet Autonomous Region in Qinghai and a little bit in Sichuan, and then did some environmental modeling to look at how climate change may also be impacting Nertskambu. And so I'm sure most of you know, but caterpillar fungus or Yertsugambu in Tibetan is often translated as summer grass winter worm because um, it's a caterpillar of or a larva of ghost moth species, which gets parasitized by a fungus that sprouts out of its head and um, is then used as an, an ingredient in traditional Asian medicine and has become quite economically valuable. And it's particularly valuable here. You can see this young one that is not yet producing any spores compared to this older one that hasn't been cleaned yet that has spores on the end. So people are harvesting them to make more money for harvesting the younger ones. And as an example, in central Tibet, a harvester could get, when I was there, could get about $22 for one piece. So they find several of these big pieces, they're making a lot of money. And it's um, really transforming the way that a lot of households are getting their income throughout the whole region. Um, but it's also raised a lot of concern that like, are they harvesting it in a way that um, is degrading the environment and that um, is potentially unsustainable since they maybe can't reproduce. Um, before they're harvested. And so um, the, that's the concern, but there's not a lot of data to be able to actually test what's actually going on beyond these assumptions that are being made. And so I again turn to local knowledge uh, to see what the harvesters themselves are observing while they're out there in their own lifetimes of experience doing this. And so this is showing, um, it gets the backdrop in blue of where the caterpillar fungus likely is. Um, the, from all the studies that I found in the literature, um, and then with my own interviews, what kind of trends are people observing in the amount of caterpillar fungus that has being produced? And the main takeaway here is that there's a lot of red on this map, meaning that people, and then here it's just showing um, interviews that were conducted within the last 10 years. So kind of giving a recent snapshot and people are predominantly saying that production is decreasing. And so then looking at why they think it's changing, um, first of all, this circles kind of shrink. There's fewer studies and fewer observations of the why it's changing. And also the number of colors is um, more diverse because people are reporting a lot more reasons for why they think production is changing. So next I looked at this, not just to get the sort of regional snapshot, but to understand if people's responses are changing through time. And so this is looking at the year that the interviews were conducted on the horizontal axis here, and then the proportion of people who were responding or giving these different responses. And basically every response option for how is or what or is production changing um, has declined through time. So fewer people are saying that it's not changing or just that it fluctuates from year to year or per capita decrease, meaning I personally am collecting less, but it's because I'm competing with more people for it. And actually the same amount is still growing. I just get less myself. 
um, fewer people are saying it's increasing. And re in recent years, many a higher, much higher proportion of people are saying we do observe a decrease in recent years. Um, then if we look at why, again, all of the other potential explanations have gone down in recent years. And there's a trend toward more people themselves saying, we think that we are over harvesting it. Um, but interestingly, there's also a trend and a more recent one uh, toward people saying, we think that the climate is changing. And so in contrast to weather of just like, well, from year to year, the conditions are different, it fluctuates. People are acknowledging that there's this directional trend in climate change that is affecting it. And even though it's still a low proportion of the, um, the observations overall, I wanted to highlight that in central Tibet, um, like in the same area where I've mostly been talking about the, my other research, climate change was actually the dominant response. And so within certain areas, they may be being affected more by the way that climate is changing. And so to examine this further, I did some modeling using everything we know about where the caterpillar fungus grows and how much is produced and found that caterpillar fungus production is higher in places that are at higher elevation with colder and drier winters. And so that's really, uh, uh, Noctu really embodies that. It's very um, high and cold and dry and is famous for its high caterpillar fungus production. And so we have this gradient of um, places that are just more suitable habitat and it depends on in large part um, the winter climate conditions for where it seems to grow well. But um, there's also this threshold on the other end where when the winter temperatures are above about negative four degrees Celsius on average, we don't really see it growing at all. So we know there's maybe this threshold beyond which it won't grow. And um, winter temperatures in particular have been warming really significantly since 1979 with the start of the climate data um, in the Southern Himalaya, where also the, the decreased responses were probably the greatest and especially in Bhutan. So this suggests that Bhutan, which is already in kind of the lower production zone may have shifted more in that direction, even in the recent decades. And we know that with climate change, um, the winters will continue to warm and that some of these current habitat areas may be pushed beyond the suitable threshold. And so Yunnan in particular is looking kind of on the cusp there. Um, and some of these other areas may shift toward less. And so this would have real implications for people's ability to generate income from harvesting this while other livelihood options like pastoralism are also getting squeezed by environmental and policy change. And so to conclude, I just wanna reiterate that climate change is really affecting these um, social and ecological systems through their impacts on people's livelihood practices. And that local knowledge, I think, can point the way toward doing more relevant and meaningful research as the climate continues to change to help ensure that we're doing work that can help, um, ideally help people adapt um, to the, the challenges that they're facing. And so I want to quickly acknowledge there's been a ton of people who've made this work possible, but here's some of my closest collaborators. And um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your talk. Um, and now we'll um, hear from Emily. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much. I'm I'm keenly aware that we're um, running rather short on time, uh, so I'm going to um, kind of cut on the fly here. Um, and I also just want to take this opportunity to say that I think that you know the point of this panel was very much to kind of think about bringing you know physical and social sciences together. I think. Kelly's work really does a fantastic job of that. And I want to just um, make one point to follow up on Hung's presentation. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's very important to get good measurements. I want to just push back a little bit on um, the idea that, you know, hydropower, if it's being built on Tibet's rivers, are um, because of developmental needs in Tibet. And the reason for that is if we look at the political economy of uh, electricity production in China right now. China has a tremendous overcapacity uh, in both hydropower and in coal-fired power plants to the extent that other sources of renewables are not being used. They're not being hooked up to the grid and they're 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 just not taking the electricity. And so uh, and that has to do with um, kind of, you know, 
crises of capital and overaccumulation. And so I think that's an example of where, um, you know, we can we can bring together some insights from social science and um, and and the biophysical sciences in thinking about, you know, what's actually happening. Um, so what I was planning to do is to kind of follow up on Kelly's talk and, um, you know, she gave us uh, some examples of local knowledge and, and how people are understanding what's happening. Um, and I wanted to take a step back and look at maybe how people conceptualize the sort of ultimate causes, if not the kind of um, uh, uh, sort of proximate causes of environmental degradation and climate change. Um, and I'm going to try to, I think this is kind of old news to, to the Tibetan studies people in the audience, um, if not to the climate scientists. So I'm going to try to really um, very briefly summarize this part. Um, and then at the end, I do want to talk about um, an issue of kind of how how we're going to how how the government is going to respond to climate change and and the reasons why we should start thinking about that from um, multiple perspectives as well. The basic point I wanted to make in this first part is simply to say, um, you know, there's not one single monolithic or univocal understanding of climate change or what to do about it, and again, uh, or environmental degradation, uh, but rather multiple perspectives. And also that, again, it's, it's quite important to understand how people on the ground are experiencing and interpreting the worlds around them, right? The, their, their world and practices and, and um, you know, yeah, how they interpret what's happening. So some interpretations or explanations view these biophysical changes through various aspects of Tibetan Buddhism. Others are more concerned with the agency of territorial deities. Um, some are, uh, one could say, more at a, at a greater distance from scientific conceptualizations of global change, or at least focus on different scales of cause and effect. And I think this issue of scale, which has come up uh, certainly in the biophysical talks, is very important. Others, including Tibetan Buddhist leaders who are invested in discourses about convergences of Buddhism and science, stress that there's no conflict and that, you know, scientific explanations get at the proximate causes and they get at the, the ultimate ones. So just a few examples. Um, first, um, melting glaciers, of course, is 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 a um, very important indicator um, and result of climate change. One well-known example is Kawakarbo and the Mignon Glacier um, in uh, that straddles um, the massive straddles uh, the Tibet autonomous region in Yunnan. Um, and uh, it's one of the, it's a, an important territorial deity as well as one of the most eight, uh, eight most sacred mountains in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and so villagers here have linked the retreat of the glacier uh, to increasing pollution, to electricity use, which is quite interesting, to the rapidly expanding tourism, as well uh, as well as to attempts to climb the sacred mountain, which have uh, has generated a great deal of um, unhappiness, and more generally to uh, a state of kind of broad moral decline. So one villager states, for example, quote, as I grew up, I saw that the glacier was receding year by year. Before tourism, our village didn't produce as much smoke and ash and the glacier was stable. Uh, since we have been seeing increases in pollution year and year, the glacier has begun to recede. Throughout history, there have never been such big impacts on the mountains. We've never had such large scale threats as deforestation and threat of road building. And another argued, if there were no people uh, going up, that is climbing, no littering, no electricity use, the glacier would recover. But in the current situation, the glacier will continue to recede. And so in this, in this instance, glacial retreat, retreat is understood primarily as a local phenomenon that results from human violations of sacred space in a set of claims that doesn't easily conform to kind of um, ontological categories of nature and society, um, right? And, and I think that's these, these ideas of like what is natural and what is social is one of the key tension points when we try to to be transdisciplinary in, in thinking about you know biophysical science and and um, other forms of understanding even in the absence of glacial melt uh, disturbing sacred mountains and their territorial deities is understood as leading to many forms of degradation um, in many cases, environmental associations have, um, you know, people have started to become very interested in environmental action because of what they see happening on their sacred mountains. Um, so, um, 
you know, one very common set of understandings is, again, kind of violating sacred mountains, um, uh, defiling springs, um, disturbing territorial deities leads to a number of um, things like drought, flooding, crop infestations, human diseases, uh, and so forth. Um, on the other hand, um, there are other environmental associations on the Tibetan Plateau who also think about sacred mountains, but think about them from, from different perspectives, such as from a Tibetan medical view. So one organ association I followed, which was founded by a Tibetan doctor, um, stresses analogies between the earth and the body, right? And, and has taught villagers that sacred mountains are like vital organs of the body. So injuring a sacred mountain is like injuring one's brain, heart, or lungs. And so unlike mere surface wounds, these are mortal wounds that can cause harm to the entire earth, again, including droughts, flooding, and so forth. Now, in addition to territorial deities, people's relationship to other forms of the non-human are also very important, including with the Lu or, or Nagas, right? these sort of serpentine um, um, uh, deities. Um, and, and these also have important environmental outcomes. So another environmental organization in Qinghai, um, also founded by a Tibetan medical doctor, is focused specifically on the protection of springs. Um, so this particular um, leader um, has worked together with college students and pastoralist volunteers to monitor and mark springs. And so they've gone out every every year to mark springs that they have they find are still existing, those that have um, dried up. Uh, he told me in 2019 that they've found um, 48 that have dried up, more than 100 that are still flowing. And each year, then they then invite ritual specialists. And here he's shown carrying an 80-year-old ritual specialist on his back to the location. Um, and they invite monks to, um, to these dried up springs and on auspicious dates. And they, they do some tantric chanting, they make mandalas, and they make offerings to these uh, lu. And they have documented, they say, seven springs that have been revived as a result of their efforts. And I think this is a very interesting topic uh, for future interdisciplinary research to understand you know, their practices from a multiple, uh, multiple perspectives. Uh, more directly related to Tibetan Buddhism, I've, I've certainly encountered um, herders who attribute, again, the ultimate cause of, to, to, of these livestock, declining livestock weights that Kelly mentioned as well, to um, the fact that we're in the midst of an age of degeneration, um, you know, a general state of world decline, and, you know, it, it's kind of hard to argue about that if you're thinking <laughs> against that, if you're thinking about global climate change. Um, in a different register, um, you know, a, another founder of an environmental association has argued that the state of the environment um, is the result of uh, accumulated karma, right? Accu accumulated collective fortune. Um, um, and, and again, argues that uh, sort of the, the secular scientific community focuses too much on proximate causes and not, um, not ultimate causes which again, I think we can interpret in a number of, of interesting ways. Another concept that's frequently de deployed is the idea of the world of the external vessel and the internal content of human beings and the idea that um, you know, the, the container arises from the collective fortune of sentient beings. And again, we can, I think, interpret that um, uh, in a number of, of, of very holistic ways in terms of thinking of climate change, more holistic than um, than sometimes the standard um, kind of Western scientific explanation. Uh, and finally, a very common understanding of, you know, loss of grassland productivity, pike infestations, generalized environmental degradation, melting of glaciers, natural disasters, concerns the removal of substances that constitute the, ju the, the, the essence or nutrition of the land or soil of which minerals are a primary form. This term um, ju uh, is, is richly multivalent. It refers to inhabitants or beings as in the, the container and the contents, but it can also mean a vital essence, potency, or a nourishment or nourishing part of the soil or earth. As one elderly pastoralist in Golok put it, Minerals have uh, been taken away, taking away the juke of the place. This has made it harder for people in the region to survive, decreasing their fortune or sonam and hindering prosperity. 
Another said, quote, there are very few snow mountains nowadays. Uh, people say it's because there's mining everywhere. The rivers have become smaller. The sources of springs have dried up. The marshes have dried up. Because the minerals have been taken away, the abundant grass that was here in the past can no longer be seen. And another explained, quote, the minerals in the earth should not be mined because this is where the essence is stored and is, and is the foundation for the rejuvenation of all living things. And this photo is of one ritual that is done to try to restore uh, some of these, um, the essence that has been taken up in their, in, you know, in their, in their world and practices through the practice of, of mining, you take away this important essence, leading to the results that in another framework are understood as the results of global climate change. Okay, and now I want to end on my a uh, different note, which, um, uh, you know, all of our presentations today have, have really talked about the effects of climate change. Um, what we really haven't talked about so much are um, efforts to mitigate or adapt to climate change. But some of the work that Kelly has done in particular, and Kelly and I have written a little bit, are, are about the justice implications of some of the um, you know, climate adaptation, so-called climate ad adaptation policies. So for example, as is well known, the state has justified the relocation of tens of thousands of herders from the Sanjiang Yuan area in the name of climate change adaptation. Uh, and yet, as Kelly's work shows, there's no reason to believe that a complete removal of grazers is actually adaptive in the context of climate change. Moreover, herders who have, re um, have experienced resettlement um, have experienced further economic, cultural, social, and political marginalization. So in other words, climate change adaptation can become another form of expropriation rather than something that actually improves lives and ecosystems. And another related response that hasn't received as much attention is China's long history of weather modification. So weather modification is not um, account advocated by the World Meteorological Organization, but it's extremely common in China. Uh, it's increasingly institutionalized and indeed, China has emerged as the world's biggest user of such technologies. They're used to produce rain, prevent rain, prevent hail, and incre increase snow. The most common form is cloud seeding, where substances such as silver iodide are dispersed within clouds to promote condensation of existing moisture to reduce raindrops. Uh, the scale of these operations is staggering. All provincial governments in China um, now have their own weather modification bureaus with budgets to control cloud weather, cloud water within their jurisdictions. Right, so jurisdiction is lo no longer just territorial; it's volumetric. Um, and provincial operations alone employ more than 40,000 people. On the Tibetan Plateau, the state has claimed that rain enhancement efforts since 2006 have resulted in increasing the size of the Jialing and um, Oling lakes in Mandu, which have been drying up. Uh, by 33 and 64 square kilometers. So this might sound like a good thing for the plateau, but I think to really evaluate, we really need to think about different scales. So in some parts of Qinghai, for example, there are documented cases of weather modification to combat drought, leading to problems for sheep herders because the heavy rainfall that results has caused injury to livestock. In the case of Kirtiruo, which Huatze will talk about next, a gold mine near the village began engaging in weather modification efforts in order to prevent rain at the mining site so they could continue producing. Uh, but pastoralists have regularly heard cannon explosions and found shells in their um, pastures as shown on the uh, photo in the right. And these loud cannon blasts and shells falling from the sky has, as you might imagine, been sort of terror terrorizing to the local pastoralists, but also in their view led to very very localized declines in precipitation, which has worsened the condition of their grasslands. So I bring all this up because right now the state is intensifying these efforts with what is called the Sky River or Tianhe project, uh, which is a plan to install and use tens of thousands of fuel burning chambers on the Tibetan plateau, which would produce silver iodide particles that would be carried into the atmosphere to seed moisture clouds with rain and snow, with the goal being to boost rainfall by up to 10 billion cubic meters on the Tibetan plateau. And more specifically, they aim to guide water vapor in the air from the Yangtze River Basin to the Yellow River Basin. Um, so di uh, diverting, yeah, five to 10 billion cubic meters of water. Um, so unlike these smaller scale efforts to date, this would be big enough to affect regional weather patterns and thus move from weather modification to climate geoengineering. 
Right. And so these efforts, I think, show that clouds, first of all, are no longer seen as just atmospheric weather feature, but rather as a water resource for human exploitation. The legitimizing narrative we see for these efforts, together with these superficial similarities, at least from a lay perspective, between localized weather modification and plans for SRM or solar radiation management, which is much higher in the stratosphere, um, can build legitimacy for SRM. Um, and I, I, this is a, an issue of, of great concern and I'd be, we don't have time for Q&A, but if there were, I'd be happy to talk about some of the, the concerns about SRM. Um, but I, but, but it's, um, you know, the more general point is um, we need to remember when thinking not just about climate change, but efforts to mitigate or adapt it, right? The actual people living on the Tibetan plateau and around the planet as we consider how to address it. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and now we'll go on to our last speaker, Hua Zijia. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> um, it's not easy to go after all those <laughs> wonderful presentations. Uh, so uh, anyhow, so I have to present since I am on this <laughs> speakers list. And so first I would like to thank um, Weatherhead East Asian Institute and Modern Tibetan Studies, uh, as well as Evelyn for organizing this um, panel. Uh, uh, because I know organization takes time and, uh, and also a lot of effort. Um, so I really appreciate um, uh, this opportunity so, so that um, scholars from uh, physical science and social science can come together and think about climate change uh, transdisciplinarily or interdisciplinarily and collaborate across uh, disciplines, uh, which I think is very meaningful. So uh, me uh, as an um, uh, anthropologist, or environment anthropologist, uh, I would like to present a kind of a, a micro level of uh, ethnographic um, understanding of uh, some of this um, climate change or changes in the land, land degradation, uh, and how it's been perceived um, at local level. Right? Um, so drawing on um, my uh, long term ethnographic research in Eastern Tibet, particularly in Zorge, um, which is located in today's Tuen province. Um, uh, in this talk, I would like to present uh, local narratives of land and, and the community degradation. Um, in this I, I use a term like local. Uh, uh, I'm consciously engaging with uh, particular forms of knowledge production uh, at a particular scale by bringing the long-term observations and the insights of local community members into focus. Um, so um, this talk uh, as part of a larger paper is informed by works of human geographers and uh, linguistic anthropologists uh, who have paid attention to the uh, politics of scale-making projects. Um, so they ask questions, very important questions. How particular skills are assembled, made, recognizable, and stabilized through various communicative projects? As well as questions such as whose skill is it? What does this skill allow us to see and know? And what does this skill achieve and for whom? Uh, so in this sense, sense uh, climate change, the theme of today's uh, panel, uh, as a subject of study, can be said to be a skill making project. Uh, for example, uh, the kinds of research methodologies we use uh, or um, remote sensing analysis, ethnographic research methods or satellite images um, can be viewed as different types of uh, communicative projects at the particular skills that allow us to see some things but not others. So in that sense, it's also important uh, to uh, collaborate ac across disciplines because uh, um, uh, 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 um, our um, particular disciplines engage particular skills. And because of that, we bring certain phenomena into focus at the expense of others. And, um, uh, and today, I will, uh, uh, what I would like to present is um, uh, similar to what Kelly and also um, again Emily presented about uh, what we call uh, local knowledge, or Tibetan pastoralist views of changes in the land. And when we talk about local knowledge or Tibetan pastoralist or herders view, um, um, of course, we need to be aware that we're not talking that 
we're not saying that the, all the Tibetan postulates espouse the same belief or they have the whole the same views. Uh, but uh, uh, as, as, as people who've lived there for thousands of years, uh, they have a, a system of knowledge that they pass from generation to generation. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, it's a, a, we use the kind of collective um, uh, collective non uh, uh, as a way to refer to that uh, system of knowledge. So here is where I did my research in Zorge for two years. Um, this is my uh, field site and summer is very nice and uh, um, uh, winter uh, uh, because of this increasing uh, desertification um, and uh, so you see the, the sand blowing into the, um, the animal um, enclosures right next to their houses. So, uh, um, and uh, uh, so today, uh, first I would like to present um, what are some of the causes of land degradation from the perspective of Tibetan pastoralists. So here I would like to start with uh, what um, Professor Emily Ye ended with the, the weather modification. Um, so uh, when you ask the Tibetan herders in this particular community, Kurdaru, uh, a population of uh, 2,500. Uh, and uh, 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 so here are some of the uh, kind of general observations. And, uh, and the first and foremost um, list of gold mining just over the provincial border in Macha, not only the primary cause of desertification in the area, but also the major contributing factor to the collapse of their community's foundation. Uh, so, so the nearby mine is owned by Machi County uh, Gold Mining uh, and a uh, um, company and was built in 1993. Uh, and, uh, and then they uh, frequently use weather modification technology to both induce and prevent rain. And the latter um, is frequently used at mining uh, sites to enable the continuation of operations. Um, so um, here um, I would like to um, present what some of the um, uh, village elders, uh, uh, um, their own observations of the impact of such a, uh, such a, a weather modification. Um, so elders in Kardaru community would tell the origin of their community as follows. A long time ago, uh, seven horse riders arrived at the intersection of Yellow River and Metro River. Uh, when the ancestors first came, they did a thorough, uh, thorough uh, examination of this land by carefully interpreting its topographic characteristics in order to find an auspicious site for their community. The beauty and abundance of this particular land, uh, Kardaru, immediately attracted them, so they decided to reside here. While there is a rich Tibetan literature on geo geomantic examinations and geomantic analysis in Tibetan Gosapshal, but one of the essential qualities to be considered in the process of identifying suitable site for the construction of a monastery, a village, or even a house is to be surrounded by complete mountains on the yuan, on the right, left, front, and in the back. In particular, the community's foundation depends on the mountains in the behind, behind the village community. And Tibetans often affectively and poetically describe this foundation as the deep brown mountain behind the community. And Jabra Mukbu in Tibetan say, a Mukbu in Tibetan names the particular place in the color spectrum, and it is associated with power, strength, and vitality. So uh, in, in this uh, translation often is a form of consequential reduction with potentially unintended effects in meaning. So in, because of that, um, the, the, this um, Jabra Mukbu in English translation can't really capture the affective weightiness of this idiom for Tibetan community. So the mining in Taumach, however, has been taking place in the mountains behind Gardaru for over two decades. So many elders in Gardaru would lament in tears about the loss of mountains in the back of their community. They say, if your community does not have an anchored tembu mountain in the back, that means your community has become an orphan. Um, and in this sense, many Tibetan herders, especially in older gen generations, interpret misfortunes in the land, including desertification, drought as manifestations of the very collapse of their community's foundation. It starts with that. So apart from the older generations reading of expanding sand as a sign of loss of land's vitality, as well as the collapse of community's foundation, the younger generation of Tibetan herders also interpret the effect, effects of mining in terms of a total disruption of annual rain and precipitation. Um, and uh, I was very 
inter uh, interested by Hong's talk, and I uh, was very inspiring to learn the kind of stream flow reconstruction over this long period of time. And um, it's, a little, it's in some ways I can relate to uh, this part of my research as well. Uh, for example, normally the lunar month of May, as the local saying goes, is the time when both the grass and water go mad. Right, so Langza Zanyun Chenyun in Tibetan we say. So implying that it is the best time to rain and the prime month when the grass grows and the water is plenty. So if the rain started coming too early, say in the early lunar month of April, it is not considered ideal as also explained in the common saying, the thunder shouldn't come late, the rain shouldn't come early. So meaning that if one hears thunder early in April, it's a sign of impending rain in May, which is the golden time to rain. The worst time to rain is the lunar month of June and July, and the rain during this period would not aid the grass to grow. So there are different local vocabularies to different types of rain. The most preferred type is called njambuk, meaning the soft rainfall, and this type of rain goes on for days. The less preferred rain is the abrupt or angry rain, charka or tangbo in Tibetan, which only lasts for a short period of time. As for snow, if snow falls during the lunar month of October or November, early in the year, some elders say that that is a sign of having more rain in the following year. And for the struggling livestock, the worst time to snow is the lunar month of January, February, as well as March, on into scarce grass buried under the snow. So um, I would, uh, one of the reasons why I would like to present this is sometimes when we look at the precipitation, it's it really also it's from the perspective of local herders, community member, it's not about the, not only about the amount, amount of rain that you receive, but when you receive the rain and in what forms. So if you don't receive the rain during the right time and in favorable forms, then even if you have a lot of rain, annual rain, um, it, um, it, it, does, it does not contribute to the uh, kind of overall well-being or health of the grassland. So, uh, and uh, a lot of the younger generations, the, they say um, uh, these um, weather modification projects has totally disrupted the nature of our annual rain. And so, um, so, uh, um, yes, that's one thing. And another thing that I, this is the, my, the place where the mine is taking place. And this is also, again, Emily shared this as well, uh, because we've been collaborating on a, <laughs> a kind of a, a, a project, a paper. So sometimes we <laughs> use um, these images and uh, some overlap. Uh, and, uh, and so another reason I would like to, um, uh, um, the, the, from the, the community members is um, the kind of the loss of land degradation is uh, um, um, uh, the um, uh, 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 the during the sorry uh, from the 1960s to the 1970s the government turned more than 400 move grassland into wheat fields primarily to feed horses for soldiers so the wheat fields have never fully recovered to grassland even after wheat plant ended in 1986 too. And the grass quality in these areas is worse and less uh, dense than in others. Especially in the winter, the wind easily blows the soil from the unrecovered wheat fields and covers the grass in both soil and sand. Villagers also point to the past practice of cutting and digging in the grassland to build salt walls as fences as a cause of desertification. So this is a kind of particular historical project that has significantly contributed to the degradation of the land um, from the perspective of the communities. And, and uh, Kelly talked about this in the presentation as well. Uh, and one of the, um, the, the, community member, the community members often talk about um, these, um, the mass poisoning of pikas, right? Pl Plateau pikas is a relative of uh, rabbit uh, kind of, uh, and have been long considered a pest by the Chinese government and blamed for causing soil erosion, degradation, and desertification. Uh, and uh, ecological research um, suggests that uh, pika is a really important keystone species animal that a lot of other animals, including um, uh, animals that have been protected at national level, depend on this. But the uh, you know, mice poisoning pika uh, campaigns still dominate the policies of the region today. Uh, and uh, so another one is, um, the Tibetan leaders, um, uh, are, um, they say that the pastures that are getting worse rather than better are the ones where pastures have been divided up to individual households 
and uh, fenced in small strips of land. So um, this is the land division uh, policy that was implemented in, in the late 1990s. But in the Gurdaru community, uh, this um, happened uh, a decade later, later in 2008. Um, although the, um, it happened la later, a lot of the community members um, observed that uh, in this, uh, for example, if you can see this on this image, in this strips of land, livestock, particularly sheep, just walk back and forth from the back, uh, from the front to the back all day long. The animals destroy more grass, grass by trampling than grazing. So if you have ever been a shepherd uh, or yakard, you would know that that uh, animals don't stay in one place. So if you release the animal from this side, they go all the way down there and they come back, all the way go down and come back. Right? So they need a uh, bigger space to uh, go around. And, um, and uh, so um, tr destroying the land by trampling is, uh, is very palpable and the communities have um, talked about that as well. And um, uh, so um, uh, some, I, I since um, Kelly also presented that there is this larger narrative of overgrazing as the primary cause of um, land degradation. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the kind of uh, state discourse and narrative. But um, uh, many herders in the rural community have emphasized how yaks, sheep, horses, and goats, which are affectionately known as the four fortune-bearing animals, Yangragubj in Tibetan, um, have played an important role in not only nurturing but also creating the pastoral landscape with the dawn and seasonal movements for many centuries. And uh, the often times when I uh, interview the site like folk songs to um, to suggest interdependent relationship between um, the, uh, the 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 animals and land and, uh, and the people. So he, I would like to here's a, here's one of them. So um, say uh, this is Tibetan uh, folk song from Zorki. Um, so he, uh, my kind of rough translation, um, so uh, little antelopes eat the top part of the top part of the grass. That is why they're so clever. Fortune bearing sheep eat the middle part of the grass. That's why their wool is so soft. Flourish horses eat the root of the grass. That is why they run so swift. Um, so, um, and here's a here's another one. It's it's kind of a citing these folks on as a as a critique, right? Right. So the nomads don't mine, farmers don't run factories. It is the wealthy and the powerful who destroys the environment. Right? So here in 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 the in the practice of citing, uh, invoking this folk songs and sayings and proverbs, uh, we can see them as a kind of a a critique of some of the dominant narratives of the land. So. Um, Um, here, I'm going to skip this part because uh, in the interest of time. Um, and so here I would like to present a one uh, case study of um, uh, uh, land restoration project. Um, and uh, uh, as um, again, Emily mentioned that Tibetan pastoralists uh, or Tibetans in general commonly interpret the loss of land's vitality as a consequence of the disequilibrium between the vessel-like external world and its inner beings, right? After enduring many years of drought and expanding desert in 2015, the villagers in Kuduru sought instructions from their foundational Buddhist teacher, Lama Kudarambuchi, who currently resides in India to restore the vitality of the, their land. So in the written letter, Lama Kudarambuchi wrote and recommended burying treasure bundles they're, they're under vulnerable, vulnerable rivers and well springs. So in the summer of 2016, Kurdaru community invited local Lama from Tukhtan Lama Monastery and seven monks to bury treasure bundles under the earth with aim of restoring the waters that was on the cusp of disappearing by healing the land and the river god Le. The briefly treasure bundles consist of um, a mixture of minerals uh, soil, uh, soil from special sites, food such as barley and wheat, and medicine that are placed in small cloth bags. The monks chant and consecrate them for seven days. After um, that, these bags are buried under special places or thrown into famous lakes. A Tibetan saying goes, if the underground is full of treasure, the people on the ground will have abundant of wealth. So, so interestingly, the Tibetan word 
um, uh, for mine that people extract from the land and the treasure bundles that they bury into the ground is the same. So both are called ter. Terju means buried treasure bundles and tergu means to extract mine from the land. For Tibetan pastoralists, burying treasure bundles is a practice engaging in reciprocal relationship between non-human beings such as the river god and the land and the people. One of the reasons that they put medicine is to heal the vulnerable river god, just in the same way a person would take medicine when he or she is healed, as explained by Alok Lama. Um, and he further commented, today the problem is there is unprecedented disequilibrium between the vessel-like world and its inner beings because we, are taking, we take too much from it while giving almost nothing back to the foundational land. And um, in the summer of 2016, Gurdharu organized a series of their ritual practices. So before the Lama and monks buried the treasure bundles, they placed some smoldering yakta on the offering platform. Uh, uh, um, while placing three spoons of roasted barley flour mixed with butter on the fire, they poured a few drops of milk on top of it and then grabbed some barley and made libations in the direction of the mountains where the village's protected deities reside. After the, that, they proceeded bearing the treasure bundles. So I described the, the process as well because uh, uh, more, uh, more people are not familiar with this practice. So maybe one day this <laughs> kind of detailed description how this has been done might become useful. Right? So in this talk in general, kind of I presented some of Tibetan herders narratives of their landscape, their changing relationship to the land as well as the explanations of land degradation. So there are intergenerational differences, inter intergenerational differences in ways of deciphering the drastic and uninvited changes and destructions in their land. There are also multiple interacting factors contributing to the expansion of sand from the local perspectives. But at its foundation, uh, many Tibetan pastoralists would say there's a fundamental mistake um, that is taken uh, without giving. So, um, and with that, I'll end the talk with a, a Tibetan prayer on the environment, on the well-being of um, environment, um, animals, people, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the prosperity of all. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Watse, for sharing your important research. Um, unfortunately, we have run over on time and um, we won't have time to take questions. However, you can email any questions you might have to mtsp at columbia.edu and we will forward your questions on to the panelists. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for sharing your um, fascinating work and for taking the time to learn more about the work being done on climate in Tibet from different disciplinary perspectives. And um, I, I um, really hope that we will keep in touch and keep these conversations going and that we can find uh, different opportunities to work together in the future. Um, and um, thank you also to the audience for joining us today and for hanging on these um, extra uh, 20 minutes with us. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I might just add too that I really appreciate the uh, the the multidisciplinary nature of this, and um, and I the uh, obviously Boniface and Hung, I'm very familiar with their work, and uh, I always appreciate their talks. But it was great to see the other three talks and see that different perspective and the exciting work that's being done. So thank you guys for that. That was great, and I look forward to discussing this more uh, between the panel uh, over the next coming weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.